Hi guys and welcome back to my uh, Beatles Analysis Redux and uh, we are in the very early years uh, Ringo didn't even have a, a Beatles haircut uh, on the cover of that record so that could tell you how early it is um, <coughs> took a while to convince him I guess anyway um, the Beatles came right out of Hamburg back into Liverpool and uh, started uh, getting to work on, on their records and um, you have to understand that these guys were pulled right out of a bar, they were a bar band and I've been in many bar bands before. <laughs> when you have creative types in that bar band of course they might say hey I've got this original song can we do it? Uh, or uh, I like for example I worked with a guy back in the 80s who was a singer songwriter all original material but then um, this was about the time uh, punk rock and new wave was coming into the scene and I told this guy about it I said we got to start a band we got to start like really it's urgent because there's this new wave we got to catch right and uh, so uh, we wound up doing a number of his originals but it was always half and half half the night was cover songs and we go far back as Elvis Presley and Buddy Holly and uh, do some of their songs and then do some of his uh, contemporary music as well. The punk rock generation also drew from the early 60s as the, uh, the British Invasion generation did. Um, uh, I think in the case of the punk rockers they were hoping for a new revolution that never quite happened. It, the energy was there and it was pretty damn good and believe it or not even the punk, uh, punkers were, were influenced by, by Beatles. They, they saw what they did, they were there for it. That's my generation of people. My older sister was a Beatles fanatic, the screaming girl and all that, but I was too young. Um, I, under, I got a feeling for it and I saw the energy and the changes that were occurring as a result of the Beatles influence. Uh, so I was deeply, deeply influenced it, but I wanted to stay cool and hip as well. By the time I was coming of age, it was uh, getting to be the late 70s, so uh, that's when the, the new wave started to happen and all these other guys you know Elvis Costello, Sting, uh, David Byrne these are all people around my age that uh, started their bands and uh, I think deep inside on an unconscious level they were hoping for a new musical revolution that happened with the British wave of the, uh, uh, the mid 60s. Anyway uh, getting back to the point so the Beatles uh, had a lot of cover material in the beginning and they must have been at a bit of a loss to fill an entire album with original music which probably caused Paul and John to start scrambling to write more and more songs faster and faster and they had already put in their 10,000 hours uh, of uh, songwriting where they they were excellent from the very beginning as I mentioned before. Um, in any case, those, because of this, I'm not going to analyze a lot of the cover songs they did. There's some great ones actually, uh, but that's not the field we're discussing. We're discussing Lennon McCartney. And also, I'm going to skip probably quite a few songs from uh, the Lennon McCartney corpus from this era because some of it's just basic rock and roll. Um, uh, um, what's the song? Uh, she was just 17. 17. And you know what I mean. I saw her standing there. That's just a kind of basic 1 4 5 blues back and forth. Uh, not exactly a, a straight blues progression, but utilizing the elements of blues um, uh, to produce her song. Certainly the bridge is blues. Um, but. Uh, the only thing curious about that song is that blues is, sits inside the Mixolydian uh, scale, which has a flatted seventh. So, but when they sing the chorus, rather than um, they go back to European style Ionian uh, harmony there for a moment. And actually, my original series was simply about balancing blues with European harmony and seeing how the Beatles kind of played back and forth with that. That song is an example of it. At least momentarily we get some European changes, but mostly it's blues changes. Um, but in any case, as I was saying, I'm going to limit some of the stuff because uh, the early material like Love Me Do and stuff like that is not very interesting in terms of chord movement and stuff like that. Um, 
So uh, what I'm going to look at is, um, do you want to know a secret? Now this is probably, George Harrison uh, probably in the beginning, John and Paul must have thought as George as he was going to be sort of a Ringo-ish figure in the sense that, well, he wasn't a songwriter, but we'll throw him a few songs as we go along. Uh, this song, Do You Want to Know a Secret, was actually written by John and Paul, given to George to sing. Uh, later on, George had the cojones to like approach them and say, hey, I wrote this, w what do you think, can we do this? And uh, you know, John and Paul magnanimously let him put a, a song or two on an album's uh, forthcoming, until they finally accepted him as close to an equal. I never thought George was ever uh, an equal as far as the, the gigantic greatness that was Paul and John. I don't think John, uh, Paul could ever, I mean, uh, George could ever uh, reach that level. Okay, so let's uh, look at this song. It starts off with an introduction. This is very, very old style and probably uh, reaches back to the 40s in the sense of, in the 40s you'd have, uh, very commonly, and I think it came from musical theaters, you'd have an introduction to a song and it's got nothing to do with the rest of the song in terms of its musical elements. There's no other recapitulation of it later on, nothing like that. And in fact, the song is uh, in E major, but the actual introduction is in E minor. Now, um, one thing I will say is this, in case uh, you get the chords and you want to play along, uh, this is the early days of music, so there are no such things as electronic tuners, so these guys probably mm -hmm tuned uh, to each other, their guitars, but what I'm trying to say is if you play an E chord to their E chord on the record, it, it sounds microtonally off, like out of tune. The, it's slightly off key with, with real tuning, and that happened very commonly back in those early days. Um, maybe they were going for 432 hertz, who knows. Uh, but in any case, uh, okay, let's look at the intro. So we got... <laughs> E minor to A minor. Nothing really surprising for a young uh, guitar player. E minor to A minor is a common movement. People discover this really quick and go, oh, that sounds like a song, you know? So, da 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 Now that's an interesting little moment. All right, uh, we talk about this is kind of the relative parallel, the parallel relative switch, but it isn't. Um, and uh, I find that curious, actually. Uh, what's going on here? Uh, we've got E minor to A minor. So the E minor is the relative minor of the key of G major. Uh, and actually, there is no parallel relative switch going on whatsoever. I'm wrong about that. Um, so we have E minor to A minor to E minor, G. F, B7. Now, there are conspiracy theorists that said that not only is Paul dead, but all the Beatles were replaced. Um, one proof that this didn't happen is um, you can hear the fingerprint of a particular composer. Like when I analyzed John Lennon, he has this obsession of the F chord moving to the B chord. That can be very dramatic. When you do that in minor keys, it's reminiscent of dramatic film music when there's a horror moment. I'm doing F minor to B minor there, but they're doing majors, okay? So, um, now, so the, the G chord is not a surprise after E minor. In fact, all these chords belong to the key of G, but the F, uh, comes out of another key. Now you could say they're doing uh, something I used to call mixing modes, which is if you keep the G root, <coughs> there is a mode, a G mixolydian mode, which will have that F. So in other words, you could say we move from G Ionian to G mixolydian. Okay. All right. Now, so, but the F, it's a very obtuse little move, movement, and there are a few obtuse moments in this song that are very interesting nonetheless. Now, uh, now all of those notes that I just played on the introductory melody belong to the key of G major, all right? So sometimes as an excuse to use a chord that's out of, outside of the key, 
you, you use a note that's in the key you're in, which in this case for the moment is G, and, uh, and uh, the note they sing is an A note, okay? Now the A note could be part of an A major chord, which wouldn't be in the key of G, could be part of an A minor chord, which is in the key of G. It could be uh, in the F sharp minor chord, uh, which is outside of the key of G. It could be in the D chord, which is in the key of G. So that A note, you could f <laughs> find a triad that has that particular note and use it as an excuse to get a colorful sound. And in this case, they actually did a pretty damn good job, but their job is they have to get from the key of E minor, which is also G major, relative major, relative minor. They have to get from the key of E minor to the key of E major. Now, this is parallel movement, and uh, parallel movement is a huge jump. When you compare, say for example, the key of C to the key of G, which is right next door in the circle of fifths, there's only one note difference between those two keys. In the key of C you have an F, in the key of G you have an F sharp but it otherwise it's the same notes of both keys. So the, obviously the keys are related. But when you get a, uh, a key like uh, G major and you go to E major, uh, there's uh, two or three, uh, let me think about this for a second. G major, yeah, there, there are three notes difference. Now when you're dealing with a, a, a a complete seven note scale, three notes difference is big, it's huge, it's a lot of difference, okay? Because the music, musical scale is limited to seven, so when you think in terms of percent, then, uh, you know, that's a three notes difference is a huge percent taken away from that scale. All right, in any case though, all right, so we're going, um, they have to get to the key of E. Now, what's the way you get to a key? You go to the five chord of that key. We're trying to get to E major. So we go E, F, G, A, B. I'm leaving out chops right now just to count up five. One, two, three, four, five. B major is the five chord that's also a seventh chord that will resolve to E. So if I take a B7, you can hear it resolve in a very classical style to the key of E. But don't forget we're in E minor and we have to go from the F chord and John Lennon, I think this might have been his first F to B moment and he just remembered it for the rest of his life because uh, you could find this in uh, songs as late as um, um, I'm So Tired. Um, in this case, in I, I'm So Tired, he moves from B to F, not F to B, but it's the same difference. <laughs> So there's that little Lennon uh, fingerprint, okay? In any case, all right, so um, now you, I told you that all of the notes that we were singing were from the key of G, aka E minor, all right, relative minor, and um, the way we get away with this B is we're singing a B note. There is no B major chord in the key of G, by the way. It does act as a secondary dominant to the uh, sixth chord, E minor. So that's a, that's a way to get there, okay? Uh, in any case, um, you know how much I really care, right? There we go to the B7. And we get into the song. Now, the Beatles uh, definitely were influenced by some cornball, loungy stuff in these early days especially, and you could hear it in a lot of their songs. And this is one of them, and I suspect that John and Paul kind of liked the chord movement, but felt the song was a bit too corny for them to sing, so they said, hey, George, you sing it. Um, so here we go. So we, um, let me review the intro chords first. E minor, A minor, E minor, G, F, B7. All right, uh, I don't need to talk about that line. It's got a little bit of interest to it, but uh, the, the main key, now we're into the main key of E major. So you can hear it right away. It's kind of like a cha-cha, jet setter, 60s, you know, loungy kind of stuff. Now what we're doing is E, 
going to its three chord G sharp minor to F sharp minor. But notice we have a filler chord. Very, very, very common. Uh, this happens in. Uh, um, So that, now I want to talk about that for a second, because if you examine the chord family template, we have one major, two minor, three minor, a whole step apart, four major, five major, a whole step apart. Now the interesting thing is, this is the only situation uh, in the template where you'll see two minors a whole step apart and two majors a whole step apart. It's the only place you'll find that phenomenon. Interesting thing is, with the minors, you could do that filler chord in, in between the whole step. G sharp minor, G minor, F sharp minor. <laughs> now, the interesting thing is, <coughs> pardon. <coughs> the interesting thing is, that can also happen with the 5 to 4 or the 4 to 5. No song in particular, I was just improvising. But if you took uh, Jimi Hendrix's, um, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, that's two major chords a whole step apart with a filler in between. What the hell's the name of that song? Wind Christ Mary. Okay, so. Uh, All right, so yeah, all right, so we have, here's the chord changes for the verse, E, G sharp minor, filler, F sharp minor, B7, E, same thing. Now, that F is a tritone substitute, here comes the F again. John couldn't resist throwing that in there, and it's a cool resolution, it's what's called a tritone substitution chord. Some uh, theory geeks might argue with me that, oh, it's not a seventh chord, so it can't be a tritone substitution. Actually, uh, the harmonic series that is generated from one particular note, uh, it builds roots, thirds, and fifths up and up and up, and then the next tone that comes up is a seventh, but it's a flatted seventh, just like a seventh chord. So that would lead you to, uh, that kind of suggests that um, the major chord in my theory, is a, a seventh chord in disguise. And in fact, this tritone substitution is. Here's F, a tritone away is uh, three whole steps. That's B. So they could have gone, um, listen. Do you promise not to do? Oh, I can't sing. <laughs> listen, listen. Da, da, da. do you want to know a secret? Not to tell. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You could almost get away with that note. It's a flat nine on the B7, but it's a little hairy. But when you go, da, 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 the F is substituting for a B7 with the normal function of a B7. This happens often in Beatles songs, and again, it's very cleverly used when they use it. Uh, the, what, one thing about the Beatles was their chord movement was subtle and their modulations were subtle. They didn't bonk you over the head with them. Uh, in the early days of Paul Simon, he was great at that. And then later on in the 70s, he just modulated for its own sake. And it was really obvious to me. I didn't like the way he modulated later on in the 70s. But his 60s work is interesting. Um, there's an art. It's a very, very subtle art. And I couldn't even point to what makes a modulation great, except the earmark of a great modulation is that um, it's subtle. You be, you almost don't notice it, but there's there's a beautiful kind of difference in the sound somehow that you know kind of tickles the ear. Okay, in any case, uh, so that that's it for the verse. I mean, that's. Uh,
basically that part of it. I'm almost embarrassed analyzing this song because it's such a cornball tune. Uh, anyway, uh, it, an interesting moment, I'd say, is when we go to the bridge, which modulates, and it's not my favorite modulation the Beatles have ever done. Here's the odd thing. When you modulate, they're going to modulate to the key of A major. Now, that's a nearby modulation. That's not... It's hard to tell the difference between E and A when you start mixing the chords together. However, in the key of E, where there would have been a B major or a B7, in the key of A, there's a B minor, and that's precisely what happens here in the bridge. Um, so, uh, the four chord of the key of E, but they're making it be the root of the key of A major instead, and they're doing a progression in A major, which is one, six, three, two, and that's that's the sour chord, really, because if they had stayed with a B, um, naturally been part of the key of E the whole time. The only thing that distinguishes this chord as being the key, uh, this uh, section as being in the key of A is that one B minor chord, because otherwise F sharp minor is in the key of E and in the key of A, C sharp minor is in the key of E in the key of A. F sharp minor is the two chord of E, one, two, and F sharp minor is the six chord, one, two, three, four, five, six, of the key of A, all right? C sharp minor is the sixth chord of, a, of the key of uh, E. One, two, three, four, five, six. And it's the three chord, one, two, three, of A major. So you see what I mean when keys are close together like this, E and A are, are like family. Um, very, very close. The one, there's a couple of different chords from the two keys, of course, because you gotta uh, discern that they're different keys. So of course there's gonna be a few different chords. Uh, in this case, the big difference is B minor, which is the two chord of the key of A, and it's no chord in the key of E, okay? So, um, uh, just let me demonstrate how it would look if all the, key, all the chords of this section were in the key of E instead of the key of A. So everything sounds the same. That would be E major. easy resolution, but they chose A major, so now you get, instead of B major, B minor. Now they go to F sharp minor. Nobody knows, just we two. Then to B. Now, um, that B is the five chord of E, so we have a two, five, one. Now, I want to talk about that uh, little moment where, uh, what do I want to talk about? Look at the A note on F chord. Yeah, now, now here's a composer's trick. When you're searching for a chord on your melody, uh, you have a note, a melody note, and say the chord switches at that moment. Let's say... Uh, oh, wait. Uh, hang on a second. I want to check my notes here. It might have been for a different section. Oh, yeah. All right, let's roll back to the intro. There's an interesting little thing here that I should show you. So, um, uh, well, maybe before I do that, I should complete this bridge thing. Uh, did we complete it? Yeah, we have the two, the five, and the one. So we're back to uh, the main body of the song. So let's go back to this intro. Uh, notice how different it sounds? Because we're in a faraway key now, the key of G major or E minor. Now, here's the composer's trick. That note, they were looking for a chord and they decided not. Da, da, uh, and that 
last note is a B, so we can easily go to that B7. But here's the tricky note. They were probably digging around saying, okay, what chord could we use? And probably it was more serendipitous than the thinky way I'm, I'm showing you right now. Da, 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 da. Now, here's the trick. The note itself is A. You can say that A is a root, in which chord, case it would be the, the root of A major or the root of A minor. So let's try one of those. Not horrible, right? Let's try A major. That's my favorite. I actually like that over the F. Now, the A note, though, uh, can also be the third of a chord, and A is the third of what chord? F major, so that's where we get what they're doing. Right? It can also be the third of F sharp minor. This will sound weird. I think it'll sound, maybe it'll sound good. That's very Paul McCartney. That's uh, here, there, and everywhere. So yesterday he does that. So that's interesting too. Um, so what I did was I chose the third. Uh, A is the third of F sharp minor and the third of F major. Uh, A can be the fifth of something. Here's where you might get some funky results. Uh, it's the fifth of D major and D minor. This is not, well D minor will sound close. Um, da -da 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 little obtuse and D is not going to work. That's not too horrible. So that you can see there are a number of choices so as a composer when you have that one note that you're looking for a chord for think of it as the the root of a major or a minor chord, the, the third of a major or a minor chord or the fifth of a major or a minor chord and you'll have six chords to choose from. If you want to go really crazy, you could think of the A as a seventh or a major seventh, in which it'd be crazy. It'd be nuts at that point. But uh, sometimes that technique will work on a seven or a nine or the higher extensions. All right, so um, I think that's all I wanted to say about this song. Like I said, I'm not going to cover a lot. I might. Uh, I might cover that to highlight, uh, I noticed that when I examine these first two records of the Beatles, there are definitely red threads running throughout, little tricks they use. The tricks were uh, use of the augmented chord, very well done use of the augmented chord, not a slap in the face, but subtle and graceful movement. Um, oh, uh, the beginning of rock chord movement, like a hint at it. You hear that in... That's later 60s, okay? So in the early days they were hinting at this hard rock um, chord movement. Uh, another thing is their introductions. Uh, they did a brilliant set of introductions in these early days that would hint at the verse melody or the chorus melody, but slightly tweaked, so it's simplified. Less notes, but definitely... Um, and then the melody comes. They use that technique a lot, like a, a, a pre preview of what's to come in their intros. Um, the Beatles had remarkable introductions and remarkable endings, as well as remarkable middles of songs. I guess all I could say it was all great um, when they were when they were great. Okay, so thanks for checking it out. See you guys soon. Much love and take care.